Welcome everyone, I am the Scot, and this will be my first book reading. The story is a fantasy novel called The Outcasts, and is written by Peter Hutton and published by Silverwood Books. Without further delay, let us begin. Chapter 1 Thief The wall was high, certainly higher than it looked from a distance, but then again, everything looked smaller from a distance. Doran sighed as he gazed up at the daunting obstacle. This was going to make things harder for him. It had to be at least 30 feet high. However, due to the age of the stone, it had eroded a little and this left places he could use as handholds to climb. At least that made the job easier. Doran stuck one hand into a hole in the wall that had slowly been created by the elements and used his other hand to feel around for another grip. Once he found one, he began to climb. It was a slow process, but at least it was possible. A new wall or a repaired one would have made this job impossible. After a couple of feet, he looked up. A while to go yet, he thought, as he made out the top. Why did there have to be a wall? He asked himself with frustration. Why not an open plain or even just a small fence that could easily be vaulted over? These people had to make things harder for him. However, he did know the reason for it. The wall was there to keep intruders such as him out of the town which lay beyond, and to protect it from any invaders. After all, the town of Sardin was right next to the outcast's land, and was prone to the occasional theft. A robber was going to steal from them right now. Him. Doran was nearly at the top now. It was a shame there was no possibility of using the front entrance he used to himself. But the idea was to avoid being noticed, and for a thief, he was not very good at it. He would reach the gates and either overact or not even attempt to pretend that his motives were sincere. Lying was not something Doran was good at, and acting was just another form of lying. He looked down at the drop below. For some reason, heights never bothered him, although he knew his fair share of people for whom they did. As he glanced down, he looked at what he was wearing. His trousers and shirt were made from very tough material, though had was worn away a little at the knees and elbows, which confused him because he couldn't remember ever falling on his elbows. Well, once he was safely back home, he could change into something that was not wearing away. Apart from those items and leather shoes, he also had a katana strapped to his back and a bag which would soon be filled with stolen food for the journey back home and whatever else he could find. The only items held within the bag were two syringes with sufficient doses of potions to knock out the toughest man for at least a day. He also had a knife strapped to his leg in case he got his trusty katana lost. The sword had managed to keep him out of many unsavoury situations, and he had not lost it yet, but it was always important to be prepared for these situations, just in case. Besides, his ideal fighting stance usually had him holding both weapons. Finally, Doran reached the top of the wall and looked over. Standing barely a few inches away was a guard, looking as surprised as Doran was to see the man before him. There was a second of silence as they stared at each other. Although to Doran, the second felt a lot longer. The only sound was that of the wind moving past their ears. The guard was dressed in armour, with the red phoenix emblem of the carriage on his chest. Judging by his face, he looked about his mid-forties, while Doran was only in his mid-twenties. So he had stamina on his side, but the soldier obviously had strength. The guard went for his sword and was about to yell, but Doran was quicker. Going for his knife and drawing it from the scabbard, he slashed at the guard's exposed throat. Instead of yelling, the guard gurgled as blood gushed from his throat to the floor, his hand frozen on the hilt of the sword. Doran cursed. Someone was going to see the blood and the body if they passed here. If that happened, the alarm would be raised and then the real problems would start. Quickly, he jumped onto the wall and pushed the guard over the edge. After hearing a thud, he peered over. The guard was lying still on the ground below. Doran took a moment to lean on the Merlon, breathing a sigh of relief. The outcome could have been a lot worse as his mission might have been over sooner than he intended. He felt relieved that the situation was resolved, but also a little sick inside. He did every time he took a life. Doran didn't like killing, but accepted it was necessary for his survival when away from home. The soldier could have had family, but that was something Doran tried not to think about. The syringe containing a potion to knock at someone was in the bag and he would never have been able to get it out in time. The first time he killed someone was a couple of years ago and afterwards he felt so sick inside that he was surprised he didn't throw up. However, 
After a time, the sickness he felt when taking a life began to slowly dissipate, and now all that was left in his stomach was the bitterness. Ignoring the sour feeling, he turned round and looked down at the town of Sardin. From this height, he could make out most of the town before him. Houses were dotted all over the place, from one end where the slums for the poor and weak stood, to the other which held the more extravagant properties. At the centre of town was the market, which was buzzing with commotion. It was midday, so it would be at the peak of life. Behind the market was the church, where the people of the Caridon worshipped their great god, Abaddon. Something that did not sit well with Dorian. All his life he had been taught to hate the gods of both Ekaridon and Duca. They were false gods, he thought, and were the reason for his mess. Most outcasts were f thrown from their homes and land because they would not follow the ways of the gods of Ekaridon. People could enjoy each other's company for years, but the moment they find out that the people they had known their entire lives just happen to not believe something they do, they are sent into exile into the void of the outcast land, where they were expected to die. Even though it was a terrible thing to do, it was not as bad as what happened in Duca if an individual did not follow their god. A much more barbaric land if the things Doran heard, heard was, was true. At the far side of Sardin was the keep where the lord of the town stayed. From the information Doran had learned, the lord was called Nerida. His wife had died years ago in childbirth, and he currently had a son and daughter. The first heir was the son, called Nock. He would get the town and the surrounding land if his father died. The lord's son was apparently a very skilled fighter and hunter. The second heir was the daughter, Selina, and there was little information on her. Apparently, she had never been seen by any of the spies keeping an eye on the nearby lord. All they knew was that she existed. This information was important for Doran, as it helped him understand the opposition he was facing. It would be a little unfair if he didn't know whose town he was stealing from, Doran thought to himself, as he observed the keep in the distance. He looked back to the town and the people moving through the streets. The clothing varied depending on how wealthy the person was. Rags were worn by the very poor, while the rich wore more precious materials. It was easy to tell what class each individual was in, a very typical village. Doran looked back down at his own clothing and decided that he would be fine and won't stand out. Too much. People would probably suspect he was from the poorer district. Some citizens wore weaponry for protection or just for show, so he didn't need to hide his katana. It was a very fine piece of steel, but was sheathed so the guards would not be able to see its quality. Otherwise, he might have been accused of stealing it, considering the clothing he wore. A poor man with a high quality blade? The handle was of finer construction too, but Doran had owned this katana his entire life and the handle's inscriptions had faded to the point of being barely legible. He walked down the staircase and into the village, avoiding anyone's attention until he had finally made his way to the centre. As he entered the market, Doran took careful note of the guards moving around. At the centre of the square stood the flag of the Keratin, with its great red phoenix poised for a flight on a gold background. The flag indicated that any people who did not come from a caravan wanting to sell their property and goods would have to pay a tax. But this did not stop them. There were stalls all over the place, set in rows so people could easily walk through them and see what each one sold. The foreign traders were still making more money than the amount they paid in tax, so they were happy to sell. Doran was aware that a caravan was a very rich land. There were clothing stalls from all over the land selling silk, leather, and even animal skins and rugs. The men from Brighton Mountains had stalls selling the best armour and weaponry ever manufactured in all the land. The people from the Mystic Grove Forest were selling the best crafted furniture and ornaments, which had many people in awe, some even had hidden magical abilities. This was because the forests had access to the finest woods and the Brighton Mountains had the best stone. Both of these kingdoms held close friendships with the Keratin, and the perks of this could clearly be seen through trade. Majors and wizards were also selling some of their products, such as books and staffs. Although some people had absolutely no magical talent, they still managed to make use of the staffs that were sold. Some were infused with magical potential, so even the least talented user of magic could still achieve results. Staffs were originally used to enhance the magical abilities of wizards and mages, but over time they had been used for other purposes, like helping with everyday life. However, only the wealthy could afford to get one. 
The making of staffs fell to the most powerful of wizards, so there was a limited number of them to go around, and this made them expensive. Thorin didn't really care much about getting his own staff. He had no magical potential, and he had done well for himself without it. The tools that he used had served him well so far, so there was no point in fixing his methods if they didn't need fixing. Doran passed a magician's stall, which sold fake magic items like gas bombs and other products like potions to heal wounds quicker, enhance senses and even allow you to see through walls. These items were produced by the weaker magic users, and their effects were usually temporary. Some of them even had a few nasty side effects that would dissuade many people from trying them again. Traders from Duca also came with rich fragrances and perfumes that had managed to grab the attention of a lot of the ladies. Again, very typical, Doran thought. But there were as few Dukan stalls as there were wizards once. This was probably due to the tensions between the kingdoms, mostly over religious beliefs. Doran sighed at the thought. Perhaps he was being brainwashed by those at home, but he never dwelled on that thought for long. The two kingdoms were at war many years ago over their religious differences. However, that was before Doran's time. Peace was made, and it was a bitter peace, as neither side actually admitted whether they lost or not. Right then. There were three things he had to do in town, not including getting in and out. First, he had to steal food from one of the stalls. Although the outcasts managed to grow plenty of food for their own, Doran had none of them for the return journey, and home was about two days' travel away, so it would be ideal if he could manage to get something. The last thing he needed was to achieve his goals only to collapse on the return journey. Unfortunately, he could not just buy the food. Outcasts left their homes with nothing when they were exiled, and they couldn't make any currency of their own, so stealing was the only way. A couple pieces of fruit and a loaf of bread ought to do it. There was a river further south, so he could get all the fresh water he needed from there. Task two was to steal whatever jewels he could from the town without being noticed. But his timing was a bit off. The massive number of people around him made stealing from the walls rather difficult. Especially those with precious items as the guards seemed to be paying closer attention to them for obvious reasons. The third and final task was to kidnap either the Lord's daughter or his son. Of the two, Nock would certainly put up more of a fight, but the ransom the Lord would pay would be a lot more than for Selina, as Nock was the rightful heir to the land. Most of the money made from the ransom would go to the outcast's cause, which is to be granted full independence. The rest of the wealth would go to drying up and turning the marshes next to the ocean into decent land to live on. This would greatly expand their borders. Ekaradin and Duca did not see the land of the outcasts as a great threat to them. They were too busy bickering amongst themselves. They also believed that the outcast land was too small to be a threat and that their inhabitants were preoccupied with fighting amongst each other. It was true that the land was home to different groups, but there was no fighting. On the contrary, they were working together to achieve the same goals. Torin laughed quietly to himself at the thought. The outcasts were more of a threat to Ikerida and Duca than they realised. After a bit of walking around, he eventually found the bakery stall. As he approached Torin, saw that the baker was a fairly broad-shouldered man, who looked like he was about in his mid-thirties, and wore neat leather trousers, a white shirt, and an apron. He gave Doran a quick smile, and nod as he neared and then went to serve another customer. Doran looked back and forth and saw no guards. This would probably be the best time, with everything clear to get the food he needed. He grabbed the loaf of bread nearest him and put it in the bag before quickly turning to move away. However, within a few steps a hand caught him on the shoulder. Doran turned to see the baker staring back, and he was clearly very angry. There was even a vein sticking out of the man's forehead. This was probably a clear indication that the baker had caught him in the act. How on earth did these thieves manage it without getting caught? He always got caught. This was bad. Doran instinctively kicked the baker into one of his stands, grabbed another loaf of bread, and made a run for it. Guards! The voice. Probably the baker sounded and faded as Doran ran. He turned a corner into the side street where the guard was waiting for him. As the guard swung his sword, Doran ducked underneath it, took out his knife and jammed it into the soldier's leg, causing the man to collapse. He then ran past the man and managed to get round the corner before the guard hit the ground. As Doran ran, he could hear footsteps from behind that obviously belonged to other guards, giving chase. 
He weaved round another corner, and then another, and another, avoiding guards here and there while trying to avoid detection. The footsteps from behind gradually diminished until it was clear that he had lost them. However, after many corners and alleyways, he was now hopelessly lost. Forget the three plans now. The alarm was sounded and there was absolutely no chance of succeeding. It wouldn't be long until an armed force would be out and looking for him. The new plan was needed, and this plan was simply to find a way out of the town. This was going to prove difficult, because for one, there was a brick wall surrounding the town, with guards stationed all over, and Doran was lost, so would likely blunder into the nobles' hall, where he would not be greeted so kindly. From this point on, he would never try something like this again. It was clear this was not his greatest strength. This could be the only chance he got, as he might not see past the day anyway. So instead of going round corners, he would have to try and maintain a straight path until he could reach the edge of the town. Eventually, after another minute of walking, Doran could finally see a wall at the end of the street. If he could run for it, climb the steps, and head back down the other side without being noticed, he would be completely free, and enough with enough food to get home. He would be a failure, but he would be safe. No doubt Severa and Pagar would not let this go. Pagar especially was going to have a fit. Not because Doran had failed, but because he had left his home when he was not supposed to. Doran at least wanted to say he was successful, but apparently this was not even going to be the case. He could not help but feel despair. Whichever way this played out, he was not going to be happy. When Doran reached the clearing, at the end of the street, the wall expanded and suddenly stopped. This confused him for a moment before he realised that it was not the wall at all, but the keep. He cursed. Getting out of the town was going to be that much more difficult. Or was it? He looked again. This place held a lot of resources. Wine, food, clothing, and weapons. He could sneak in and steal a guard's uniform, and the rest would be easy. This was his chance. Doran sneaked past two guards and into the keep. Their attention was attracted to the commotion taking place not far away. His escape had created quite a stir amongst the people. He then moved through the corridors without too much difficulty. The place was deserted. This was the Lord's house, so why were there so few people here? Perhaps they were all at the market. It was brilliant that all the soldiers were out looking for him in the town and not in the keep. Doran had also studied the keep's map before he arrived, so finding the storeroom was easy. He just had to stay away from the Lord's rooms, as the family were no doubt being protected by fighting odds that even Doran would not willingly face. He peered round the corner and saw another guard at the entrance, and held his dagger out at the ready. News spread fast. The whole town must know now that a thief was in their midst. He thought that there would be a, an occasional thief stealing bread from within the town. But apparently not. The people here seemed to be pure-hearted, or were they just too scared to break the rules? Doran peered round the side to the guard, who had clearly not noticed the head sticking round the corner. The quickest man will win, Doran thought to himself. He dashed round the corner and headed straight for the man. The guard noticed and raised his sword in response, but was too slow as Doran hit him on the head with the hilt of the dagger. The man fell to the floor with a thud, out cold. It would be a while before he could recover. Doran took a step over him and entered the room beyond, closed the door behind him and looked around. The room was filled with all kinds of fruit and vegetables, a lot of which seemed to be rotting a bit. Obviously, the people of Sardin were well fed to be able to leave some food to rot. On the other side was armour of many different sizes, and weapon racks carrying different varieties of swords, spears, bows and arrows, pikes, maces and daggers. At the far end of the room were some of the wine shelves and a huge assortment of wines and mead. Clearly the Lord liked his drink. They took up more than the room than the weapons and food did, and it was a rather large storeroom, all of which was devoted to the keep itself. There were other stores in town that were intended for the public. This was the Lord's private stash. Looking, Doran noticed that beside the wines was a young woman, about her early twenties, holding what looked like a bottle of red wine in her hands. She had long brown hair that was tied neatly back and was wearing a blue dress that covered her from shoulders to feet. He couldn't even see her feet. This was not important to Doran as he gazed upon the one trinket that was on her finger. It was a ring of nobility. The girl was of nobility. So this must be Selina. Ah, hope at last. 
She had a confused expression on her face, but recoiled when Doran smiled. Perhaps he smiled too harshly. It was an evil smile, but the point was made. She made a run for the weapon rack and drew out a broadsword that was clearly too heavy for her as she tried to lift it off the ground and point it towards him. Well, at least he now knew how much difficulty she was going to be. The girl clearly had no fighting capabilities, and the fact that he had not been blasted into the wall indicated she had no magical potential either. This should be easy, he thought. He moved casually towards her and put his knife back into its holster. As he approached, he had noticed a look of panic in her face and could not help but wonder what she planned to do next. Gazing at her expression as he approached, he caught her eyes. The curler was unlike that of any eyes he had seen before. They were golden. You couldn't help but notice something like that, especially something you don't usually see. Not a mere hint of gold, but really noticeable. However, his attention soon shifted back to her efforts to wield the broadsword. She didn't say much, he thought to himself, not even to say stop or don't come closer. Did she know these would have been futile efforts? Or was it because she was spending all her energy trying to handle that sword? Get out, or I'll stab you. Hmm, thought Dora. Apparently I speculated too soon. The high-pitched way she said it didn't make the threat very, well, threatening. Once he neared her, she made a lunge for him. Doran took a step to the side and drew the needle from his bag. But when she attacked, she couldn't train the sword round for a second attempt in time before Doran moved to the side and plunged the needle into her neck. It was a knockout por potion for the purpose of kidnapping one of the large children, but she didn't know that. She probably thought he was an assassin out to kill her. Once the needle was removed, he let her go and the girl walked dizzily away towards the door. After a few meters, fell. Doran caught her before she hit the ground. He was a bad person, but not bad enough to let that happen. She had to be kept in good condition anyway, otherwise Lord Nerida would come back to his home with a vengeance. Right, time to get her out of here, he thought. Looking around the room, there had to be a means of getting her out. He retrieved a sack that was big enough for her and put her in, then quickly grabbed some rope from the weapons rack and put that in as well before heading in for the exit. She wasn't too heavy to carry, but if the guards found out who he was, then he would not be able to run with her for long. He reached the unconscious guard and stepped over him once again. The guy must have been her bodyguard. What a dreadful bodyguard, as he could not handle Doran for more than a second. He must be you. Doran continued back the way he came towards the exit, but as he neared, he saw another man blocking his way and looking right at him. He was around his early thirties, with short black hair and a black shirt and trousers, and he was very big. He must have been about six foot four, with broad shoulders and arms, but with an agile look about him. It was a good thing that Doran wasn't going to fight him with his disguise on. But then, why was this man glaring at him? Doran looked down and cursed. He had been so preoccupied with Selina that he had completely forgotten about the disguise. Well, he was going to have to fight him, just what he needed. He put the sack down gently, and at the same time picked up a stone as the man stood silently waiting for Doran to make the first move. Why was he not calling for aid? The black attire he wore might mean he was not also where he was supposed to be, but considering he had clear intentions to harm Doran and a very confident expression, Doran suspected that the man held a sense of confident victory about him. This angered Doran. He thought he was going to win this fight without backup. I'm just going to have to show the man otherwise, he thought. He braced himself and lobbed the stone down the corridor, aiming straight for the larger man's head. However, the man caught it in his hand and with a sneer in his face. He threw it back with such ferocity that Doran only just managed to duck in time as the stone shattered on the wall behind him. Doran stood up again and drew his katana for the first time today. The man drew his own broadsword, except unlike Selina, this man wielded a sword that actually looked like it suited him and he wasn't waving it about stupidly. Apparently he was not going to be as easy as Selina. Doran charged and made a stab at the man, but it was parried at an angle so that the man could easily stab back quickly. However, Doran saw this coming and took a step to the side. The man adapted the stab into a swing and Doran had to quickly block it with his sword. The four sent him back two steps to avoid falling to the ground. The broadsword swung again and the katana parried it at an angle so it would bounce off and the man would take that much longer to recover. Doran was about to make another stabbing attack when the man punched him in the face, realising that the sword wouldn't come around in time. 
Both Dorian and the man took a step back, readying themselves again, and attacked. An exchange of blows occurred as one tried to get an advantage over the other. It seemed to be an even match, and it became clear that the loser would be the first one to make a mistake. The man made another jab, but went too far and stumbled forward. Doran seized the opportunity and made a downward sweep with his katana, cutting the man's sword arm clean off. The arm fell to the ground with the sword hitting the stone, making a clattering noise. The mutilated man did not show pain, but rather shock and despair, as Doran turned his sword sideways and jammed it into his heart. The man slumped to the ground and was still. Doran did not hesitate and quickly grabbed the sack containing Selina before racing outside again and back through the city, maintaining the same tactic of going in one direction. He kept going until he eventually found the real wall and not another keep. It would have been really bad luck to come across two keeps Doran used to himself as he made his way to the wall and could see no guards nearby. There were steps further along and he moved across and up the stairs to the top of the wall. Doran then dipped the sack and pulled out the rope. Luckily, Selina was still unconscious. She should be out for a while, as the knockout potion was supposed to knock out a fully grown man for at least a day. Hopefully, Selina would be out cold for long enough to allow Doran to get all the way back safely. Doran tied the rope round the sack and lowered it to the ground below. Once it reached the bottom, he let the rope fall, and at that point he heard a yell from behind. Sighing, Doran knew that what that meant. It was a miracle that he had made it this far without being caught, but it was still annoying that he was so close, only to be seen once more. He turned round and saw another guard. This one was knocking an arrow and readying it to fire. Quickly, Doran disappeared over the side and started to climb down as the arrow flew over the wall where he had been standing. The man was obviously a good shot, considering that when Doran last checked, the archer was a distance away. He raced down as fast as he could, and almost slipped as one of the handholds did not support his weight and broke off the wall. Luckily, he managed to catch another one in time, and kept moving. At a reasonable height, he dropped and hit the ground below with a thud, bending his knees as he braced against the impact. At that point, the archer appeared at the top of the wall and released the arrow. Luckily, it hit the ground beside Doran, as the man was obviously in too much of a hurry to aim correctly. If he had taken his time, Doran knew he would have been dead. Without hesitation, he picked up the sack and made a run for it. Another arrow flew overhead and hit the ground ahead of him. Keep missing, Doran desperately thought to himself. Safely was just a short distance away, and he would be out of range for the archer. By the time the soldiers made it round to where he was now, he would be long gone. But when the second arrow flew, he knew it was futile. They were too close. The man was a good shot. There was no escape. But then something strange happened. He felt a sensation hit him. It was so unusual, like everything seemed to slow down. He could sense the land, he could sense the surroundings, and feel them move. He even knew that a few metres away, there was a single ant that seemed to have lost its colony a few metres to its right. He could feel the arrow flying through the air, and knew that at its current velocity and angle, it would hit his head directly. He turned as fast as he could, and with all his might swung his arm round, catching the arrow with an inch between the point and his forehead. For a second, everything stood motionless and still as the sensation slowly disappeared and Doran was back to his normal self. The archer on the wall was as stunned as he was, but after a second, it was Doran that came to his senses first and he quickly gave the archer a finger gesture before turning and running again. The archer still just stood there, stunned, as Doran kept running out of range of the bow and safety. End of chapter. Now, I hope you enjoyed my book reading today. If you did, please hit that like button, and I will see about maybe getting chapter two done.